All right, well, let's get into this outline, the nature and purpose of apologetics. And I want to read something from Blaise Pascal, one of my favorite Christian philosophers. Men despise religion. They hate it and are afraid it may be true. The cure for this is to first show that religion is not contrary to reason, but worthy of reverence and respect. Next, make it attractive. Make good men wish it were true and then show that it is. Worthy of reverence because it really understands human nature. Attractive because it promises true good. I think that's quite an arresting and illuminating quote because it underscores several important things. One is that we have to realize that the natural person has an antipathy to the cross. Just read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 if you don't believe that. So even if we talk about seekers, People that are interested in the spiritual, which is very vague and amorphous in our culture, can mean almost anything, including getting channeled messages from your pet. We have to realize that there is this basic antithesis between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness, and that people in their fallen Adamic nature hate the cross. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot engage in apologetics. You can. Otherwise, the class will be over right now. But we have to realize that this is an ongoing reality of the human condition, this animus against the gospel and the cross of Christ. They hate it and are afraid it may be true. Some people don't investigate Christianity because they're afraid it might be true, meaning they have to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Christ. So the cure is to show it's not contrary to reason. We're actually created to follow God. We find our ultimate fulfillment by following God, even though that involves suffering. But it is worthy of reverence and respect. Make it attractive. Make good men wish it were true. That means show what it is. Show the goodness of God in the creation. Show the love of God through the cross. Make good men wish it were true, meaning appeal to to people's better nature, by that I mean appeal to the fact that they are made in the image and likeness of God. Don't appeal to their base side. That is, don't use bait and switch techniques with people, but appeal to their sense that human beings ought to pursue truth. Make them wish it were true and then show that it is true. Worthy of reverence because it understands human nature. That's part of the apologetic, not all of it. Attractive because it promises true good. Thinking there of forgiveness of sins, reconciliation to God through Christ, the final state, and so on. Not everything of apologetics is summarized in this snippet, but some very important things are. Let's talk about the definition of apologetics. I call it the rational defense of the Christian worldview is objectively true, and we'll camp out on that a little bit later. That is extremely important. Objectively true and existentially or subjectively engaging. More generally, apologetics is the commendation of Christianity in the face of unbelief unbelief or doubt. Now, to successfully prosecute this class, we have to cover a lot of ground. And we don't start with arguments for the reliability of the Bible. In fact, we don't even start with arguments for the existence of God. We've got to back up several steps and start with the nature of truth and the importance of rationality in discovering truth. Now, maybe 50 years ago, you could start an apologetics class right off with the existence of God, reliability of the Bible, dealing with some of the objections to faith, the problem of evil, Darwinism, and so on. But now you can't start at that point because many people think that Spirituality is basically a consumer item. And there are as many spiritualities as there are people. And so, you may deal with someone who is not hostile to Christianity, but neither are they a Christian. They simply think that Christianity is something that fits your lifestyle, but it does not fit their lifestyle, right? Or, it is true for you, but not true for me. Or, it was true for me at one point, but now it's no longer true for me. Or people that when they discuss the spiritual realm at all, 
think that rationality is a hindrance. That spirituality is irrational. And the more irrational it is, the better. And sadly, we even find Christians in this category. There's either the downplaying of apologetics, the ignoring of it, or insulting it. And this, I'm I'm very sad to say, is fairly common in evangelical pulpits and evangelical books. For instance, in the uh, fantastically popular book by Rick Warren, The Purpose Driven Life, he says God calls us to be witnesses, not attorneys. So we shouldn't actually argue with people about the truth and rationality of Christianity. What we should do, rather, is simply tell our testimony. And when he makes that facile distinction between being a witness and being a lawyer or an attorney, he cites 1 Peter 3, 15. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the faith that you have. Now, interestingly, that word there, be ready to give an answer, is the Greek word for apologetics. It's a legal term for setting forth your case in a court of law. And Warren appeals to that, saying God doesn't call us to be attorneys to argue a case, but to be witnesses to tell our testimonies. The crock alarm should go off here. It doesn't really matter how popular Rick Warren is, or how many millions of books he sells, or how many conferences are are, uh, celebrated at his church. He is absolutely dead wrong at that point. We'll get back to to this verse. But apologetics is oftentimes marginalized or worse yet, people think that Christianity is irrational and that's fine. We'll talk about that, fideism. But that's what apologetics is. The rational defense of the Christian worldview, we'll talk about worldview, objectively true and existentially subjectively engaging. So we want to link the truth of God to people's real life situations. It's a both and, it's not an either or. And more generally, the commendation of Christianity in the face of unbelief or doubt. I really understand apologetics extremely broadly. The architecture of your church should be an apologetic argument. That is, your church should be a place that is conducive for worship, conducive for understanding the transcendence and holiness of God. The way you dress, the way you speak, the books you read, the way you drive your car, the way you interact with other people on the telephone or on the internet should be an apologetic. It should be some kind of commendation of your Christ-like way of life to those who do not yet understand it. So it's extremely broad, really. But we will be targeting more the specific argumentative side for the purposes of this class. All right, questions or comments on that definition? Yes. Yes. Yeah, every worldview attempts to commend itself to outsiders. Even the extremely irrational ones like Zen Buddhism will say, well, if you sit in front of a wall for four hours in the proper position, eventually, under the proper tutelage, you will become enlightened. And once you're enlightened, you will understand that you have transcended your mind. There's even a kind of apologetic there even though it's a deeply irrational sort of worldview. There are Muslim apologists, Buddhist apologists, apologists for Judaism against Christianity, apologists for Mormonism against Christianity. Any religion that is interested in propagating itself will attempt to commend itself rationally. Okay? Yes? Mm-hmm. It's both. Yeah, Paul uses his testimony and he also gives rational arguments, especially in Acts 17. So it's a both and. See, I said it was a, fa- a facile distinction. It was a false distinction. It's a both and. But you see, if you only give your testimony and you don't go on to speak of why you think Christianity is true and rational, then what about everybody else who gives their testimony? The Mormons, the Zen Buddhists, the New Agers, the Muslims? They have testimonies as well, and sometimes they seem more fascinating than ours. 
So simply telling your story is not sufficient. You have to show that your story connects to objective reality. Because everyone is out there telling their story at one level or another. So you do give your testimony. There's power in that. But it's not sufficient. Okay, that's my point. All right, so apologetics concerns the defining truth claims of Christianity, things that need to be believed in order to be a Christian, the essentials of orthodoxy, the Trinity, the Incarnation, biblical authority, justification by faith, and so on. It may, re- it may branch, though, into other areas. It could be you're interacting with someone whose obstacle to becoming a Christian is not a major doctrine. It might be something like, all these churches have different understandings of baptism. I mean, I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me. So I just want to opt out of the church entirely. Because I have one group telling me I have to be baptized to be saved. I have another group saying you don't have to be baptized at all, Quakers. And I have another group saying, well, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. If these people can't even get straight on this thing, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Right? So maybe to be a savvy apologist for this person, let's call him the baptismally confused person, you have to have down your doctrine of baptism. So apologetics is very flexible. You have to spend the time in the woodshed. And a lot of this class may be at a level that you will not engage people at face to face, person to person. But if you can master it at this level, you can probably deal with them face to face if you have any relational skills at all. But you see, it's flexible. Now, there's a method that I advocate in apologetics. But the person you're talking to is an unbeliever or the believer who's struggling with doubt, has not read my lecture outline. So he or she is going to come to you with anything that keeps them from coming to Christ. And you have to be ready to try to give an answer to that objection. So to be very flexible, very humble, very open to trying to identify what the weakness is in this person. Where does their own worldview break down? And where do they have a false view of Christianity? Or what is it that's keeping them from coming to the cross of Christ. It has to do with truth claims. We'll talk more about that later. But a truth claim is a proposition affirming the existence or non-existence of a certain state of affairs. And and a, uh, a proposition is different than a sentence. A proposition is what a sentence affirms. This actually is extremely important because postmodernists deny this. We'll come back to it. But just as a preview, propositions are the carriers of truth. Sentences are too in a different sense. Now, what do I mean by a proposition? You could say, Jesus is Lord in English. I just did. Could somebody say it in Spanish right now? Okay. Can someone say it in another language? German, French? Tell me what the language is before you say it. We're all a bunch of monolinguists. German? Or what? Okay, and that is? Cantonese? Okay, any other language? Okay. Okay. Now, those uh, four or five acoustic blasts that we heard are very different from each other, aren't they? But they mean the same thing. That's because they all affirm the same proposition. Now, postmodernists and other confused philosophers deny the existence of propositions. We'll come back to this later, but it is, it is intrinsic and crucial to theology and apologetics that we understand what propositions are and that we articulate them clearly, that we defend them, and we understand what other propositions non-Christians believe. So, a proposition is an affirmation. It declares something. A proposition is is different than a question. So, if I say, what time is it? I'm not making a propositional statement. If I say, hooray, yippee, or if I say, ouch, or if I say, please read the syllabus, those are not propositional statements. They're emotive utterances, ouch, yippee. They're imperatives, do this. There might be interrogatives, What time is it? But they're still in the propositional neighborhood because they still assume the existence of propositions. We'll come back to this. But it is extremely important, trust me, 
that you get down this concept of proposition. Because there are a lot of people inside and outside of the church who are saying that the idea of a proposition is a rationalist mythology. It's an abstraction that doesn't really relate to how we use language. Now, once you say that, language then becomes incapable of communicating truth. If you deny the existence and the intelligibility of propositions, language becomes mute with respect to truth. We'll come back to that. All right, let's talk a little bit about the relationship between apologetics to theology. If you have any questions on that section one, just went over. All right, what is the relationship to theology? Well, apologetics is dependent on theology for its content. If you're going to defend the Christian faith, what are you going to defend? The classic Christian doctrines. But you may have noticed that not all Christians agree on the classic Christian doctrines. Now, we have sort of a circle of basic orthodoxy, trinity, incarnation, justification by faith, biblical authority, and so on. But then when you get into sovereignty of God, certain aspects of Christian conduct, baptism, we have disagreement. But if you're going to defend what you take to be true, you have to be theologically savvy. So a lot of your skill as an apologist will come, obviously, outside of this class. Now, I try to be as theologically enriching as I possibly can in this class. But this is not a theology class per se. So let's say if someone attacks the doctrine of the Trinity as illogical, you need to understand what the doctrine of the Trinity is. Is it really three equals one? I hope not. Because if it is, it's intrinsically illogical and it cannot be true. Or is it something else? And what biblical passages would you appeal to to defend the Trinity? All right. So it's dependent on theology for its content. And honestly, different theologies will engage in different types of apologetics. There's a movement right now, I'll only mention it just very briefly in passing, called the Openness of God movement. And the Openness of God claims that God does not exhaustively know the future. The future does not now exist, and we have libertarian freedom, so God does not determine what we do. And they also deny something called middle knowledge, so that means that God cannot know the actions of free agents. There's nothing there to be known. And what drives the openness of God movement is the problem of evil. This is somehow an attempt to get God off the cosmic hook. If God does not know what we are going to do, if he does not control the actions of human beings, then he is not responsible for much of the evil in the world. So let's say if Greg Boyd were giving a lecture on the problem of evil, how can we believe in an all-good, all-powerful God and so much evil? He would give an extremely different lecture than I would because I'm a flaming Calvinist, as you'll find out soon. We're both Christians, all right? I don't doubt his salvation. I doubt his theology. And his theology will affect his apologetics. And he is one bright guy, believe me. I mean, if I ever had to debate him, I'd have to really spend time in the woodshed, because he is one smart cookie. I think I made that point. <clears throat> Theology's ideal is to systematically and coherently articulate what Scripture teaches. I am so sick of people bad-mouthing theology. From the pulpit, from anywhere. Theology is truth about God that we derive from the Bible using logic and in relationship to the other things we know to be true. Any Christian should love theology because you love God. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind and your neighbors yourself. If you believe the Bible is God's revelation in written form, if you believe he created us in his image with the ability to reason and put things together coherently, wouldn't you like to know about, know as much about God as possible and apply as much about God as possible to life, whether it's culture, politics, whatever it is? Theology is essential to developing a Christian mind, developing a Christian witness. Now, are there abstruse, opaque, indecipherable theologians out there? Yes, they're crummy. There are crummy 
theologians who don't highly prize clarity, logic, and so on. But that doesn't cast a, uh, a dark cloud over all of theology. Anything worth doing can be done poorly. Okay? So we should develop a theology biblically, and we also need to develop a theology of apologetics. We'll develop this as the class goes along. Certain theological truths have a major impact on how we apply arguments to unbelievers. Questions of human depravity. There are some people who think that human beings are so depraved that the uh, noetic effects of sin are so powerful that there's really no common ground with an unbeliever. You have to basically preach to unbelievers and ask them to just take on the Christian worldview wholesale. Otherwise, they can't make sense of anything. So there's really no point of contact or common ground because people are so thoroughly depraved, they can't even use logic to form proper arguments for Christian faith. Now, if that's your view, your apologetic arsenal is very, very small. And in fact, I think you're also going against much of the Bible, which uses arguments in service of faith. We'll talk about that more later. On the other hand, someone might think that sin has really not affected us that much cognitively. And so we don't have to worry about that aspect of it. There's also questions about general revelation. How much has God made known to the unbeliever in nature and conscience? The question of divine transcendence and imminence. If God is uh, utterly removed from us and the only point of contact is the Bible, then apologetics is basically out the window. That was Karl Barth's position, for instance. So theology and apologetics are very closely related one to the other. In fact, some theologians argue that apologetics is inappropriate. They argue for what's called fideism. That faith is an island unto itself. Fides means faith. It means faithism. So faith receives no support from reason. In fact, it can't. If it did, it wouldn't be faith. Now, we'll go on to challenge that, but some, some theologians... And uh, some biblical scholars try to make that point. All right, questions or comments there? Relation of theology to apologetics. All right. Relation of apologetics to philosophy. Apologetics comes under one category of philosophy, namely the philosophy of religion, which is the rational investigation of religious truth claims. But certainly not all philosophy of religion is Christian apologetics. Has anyone had a philosophy of religion class where they dumped on Christianity for the whole class? Okay, yeah. It happens quite a bit in the secular universities. There are people who have made their career in the philosophy of religion who are atheists or who are agnostics. So, the philosophy of religion is one branch of philosophy proper and it presupposes no religious faith. It is an enterprise to attempt to critique religious doctrines, religious assertions, rationally. So certainly not all philosophy of religion is Christian apologetics. It may be done in service of Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, atheism, agnosticism, uh, or any other worldview. Okay? Now, attempts to rationally justify theological statements through philosophical means... Things like theistic arguments, defending the coherence of doctrines, and so on, uh, don't have to be propaganda or proselytizing. Now, we face a lot of challenges and barriers in our setting, our pluralistic setting. And one of them is that if you advance a strong thesis about your religion, you defend and articulate a worldview, the idea is that you are somehow propagandizing or proselytizing. So the virtue that is held up by so many is tolerance, quote unquote, which means basically you ought not say anyone else is ever wrong. You should appreciate and endorse and in fact even applaud everyone's perspective on everything, which is a recipe for becoming intellectually unhinged. And in fact, it can only be done when you have a relativistic notion of truth. When truth becomes relative to the person as opposed to 
either connecting or not connecting with objective reality. So some people say, well, if you're advocating Christianity, it's intrinsically propagandistic, which means you're somehow not doing it fairly, not doing it carefully, not doing it honestly, or it's proselytizing, meaning you're somehow bending people's arms. You're either threatening them or you're promising them something, you know, either the carrot or the stick. But it doesn't have to be like that at all. You can simply say, look, I believe this worldview is true. And this is what I mean by truth. Here are the reasons why I think this worldview is true. If you have any objections to this, let me know and we'll talk about it. We have a fairly free, fairly open society. Last time I checked, the First Amendment is still in effect. So let's have a conversation about this. It doesn't have to be proselytizing, propagandizing, in the least. And it's amazing to me the kind of double standards that are out there. I gave a talk fall of 2000 in Boulder as part of a Campus Crusade outreach. It was an outreach they were using in the early 2000s where they would get one student and use the student's testimony and create a big event around the testimony. Any of you remember this? They used a particular woman's testimony. I can't remember her name right now. And she came on and gave her testimony and tried to answer some questions and that didn't go too well because I was there to answer the questions but she tried to answer the questions. But anyway, the first question that I got after I gave my talk was, was this. When are you Christians going to stop propagandizing the campus? Now, you know, technically that's the fallacy of the, uh, of, of the uh, assumed question, right? I mean, you're assuming that you're propagandizing the campus and when are you going to stop? It's like, have you stopped beating your wife yet? You know, that kind of a fallacy. And I said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, there are posters all over the place promoting Christianity, promoting these events. And I said, do you believe in the First Amendment? Do you believe that we have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of religion? And no one is forcing you to come to this event. No one's forcing you to do anything of a Christian nature. And after all, when I came in this room, I saw advertisements for Tibetan Buddhism on the window. I mean, after all, this is bolder. <laughs> so I said, we're not, we're not propagandizing, but we will continue to propagate our faith and we have the freedom to do it and so do you, whatever your faith is. But oftentimes there's an implicit double standard. Everyone else can propagate their faith, but somehow Christians can't. So what we need to try to do is level the playing field and the best way to do that is try to discuss what your worldview is and what another person's worldview is and then give reasons for or against their basic view of the universe. Okay? Now, the good news here in the relationship of apologetics to philosophy is in the last 25 to 30 years, Christians in philosophy have been flourishing there has been a tremendous resurgence of Christians doing high-level, competent, well-respected work in the discipline of philosophy. And I've mentioned two books here and two journals that indicate this. Alvin Plantinga was really the pathbreaker in many ways, but other people, such as uh, Dallas Willard, William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland, William Alston, and a host of others, this is a tremendously fruitful time to be a Christian interested in apologetics because there is a lot of very high level, extremely challenging, competent work out there in this area. All right, questions on that? The relation of apologetics to philosophy. Come on, somebody has a question. I'm sure. You'll warm up as we go on. All right, what about the relationship of uh, apologetics to evangelism? Well, we use apologetics when necessary to remove obstacles to evangelism. So, if you present the message to someone and they understand it, which is quite an achievement today, that someone would understand what Christianity truly is amidst all the stereotypes and all the straw men out there, and they speak it back to you so you know that they understand it and they say, okay, I understand what it is but I do not believe it. Well, 
That's when apologetics starts, right? I mean, part of apologetics is accurately explaining what it is. Because you don't want to give someone a false notion. But if you invite someone, hear the claims of Christ, and he invites you to come to him, repent, and accept the good news, and take up your cross and follow him. And by the way, please don't leave the cross out of evangelism, because if you do, it's not evangelism. I mean Christ's cross and your cross, both of them. I mean, look, look at it for yourself. It's right there in the message of Jesus. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's not optional. It's not a second, second stage of sanctification. That's what it means to have that orientation in your life, to be a believer, to be a follower, to be someone who repents before Christ. But if someone gets the point and they don't believe it, and they say, well, I understand it, but I don't believe it because, well the New Testament has been corrupted. So we don't know what Jesus really said. All right? Then you have what? An apologetic issue to deal with. Or it can't be true because that means people in other religions go to hell. All right? Now you've got an apologetic issue. Right? Or maybe more sophisticated, you claim Jesus is God and human. That's impossible because they would have incompatible properties, the divine and human. A little more sophisticated, right? Right? You'd have to deal with that. So, oftentimes, apologetics comes in the wake of evangelism refused. Now, there's not a hard and fast distinction between the two. But you might say that evangelism declares Christian truth and invites unbelievers to embrace it, whereas apologetics defends the truth and clarifies its meaning. But, really, I think in everyday interaction, they go hand in glove. They work very well together and they ought to work well together. Now, you could be so into apologetics and defending all the arguments that you forget to ask the person to accept Christ, right? I mean, that'd be a pretty bad omission. Or you could be all evangelism, all exhortation, all invitation, and you just wave your hands when there's any kind of challenge or question to the intellectual nature of your faith. Now, both are obviously wrong. Now, some people are more gifted in one area than others. I'm much more gifted in apologetics than evangelism. I can't tell you loads of people have come to Christ through time I've spent with them. But I can tell you loads of times where I've answered people's questions and interact with people in open settings and talked to unbelievers and have engaged in apologetics. Now, I wish I had the gift of evangelism. It would make my life a lot happier. You know, and a lot more fulfilling. And whether or not I have the quote of gift, quote-unquote, of the evangelist, I, I, I am to evangelize. All right? I'm not off the hook just because I'm not Billy Graham and neither are you. But these gifts may shake down a little differently for different people. But my point is that they work together, they work in tandem. And typically, if we present our faith to anyone at all, it's usually evangelism without apologetics, at least in our culture today, because of the anti-intellectualism, because of the ignorance <clears throat> because we've let the enemy gain far too much ground, really, uh, in this area of Christian witness. You might view apologetics as a kind of pre-evangelism. You know, you shouldn't always press people to say a prayer of commitment to Christ if they don't understand what it means or if they still have severe doubts. Because, as Schaefer used to say, Francis Schaefer, the only reason to become a Christian is because it's true. And if a person is not to the point where they think it's true, then you really cannot invite them to accept Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. So, apologetics and evangelism, Christian witness, always requires a lot of spiritual sensitivity and a lot of prayer. And it also involves a lot of trial and error. Because we're human beings. We're fallen human beings. We make mistakes. Sometimes we lack courage. Sometimes we're too bold and we're obnoxious. But both apologetics and evangelism work together. Questions or comments on that? Examples? Yes. I have an example. Good.
very, very low level apologetics answering questions about how we can prove the resurrection is true and so on. Mm -hmm. We had 30 kids come to Christ when we presented the gospel. Hmm. Great. And they pretty much knew what was going on at that point. Yeah. And they had some of their basic questions answered and they, they were ready. They knew what it meant. Good. Praise God. That's great. You know, and at that point, you don't say, well, but have you thought through all the objections to Christianity? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be stupid. Now, maybe later on, more questions will come up and then you deal with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, by having conversations with people, by engaging people authentically. Now, you may have studied a lot, but you don't simply want to recite a textbook to someone. You see, you have to own it. It has to become part of your being. And the way that happens is through experience. It's one thing to understand an apologetic argument. It's another thing to present it to an unbeliever. So, you don't want a canned response. And you know, Hank Hanegraaff at his worst sounds like a computer. Right? It's like, eh, the, you know, just push the JW box, eh, push the Mormon box button, rather, and this canned response comes out. And sometimes he doesn't seem like he's really listening. When I said jazz musicians have good ears, you know, what really is the question? And each human being has their own specific questions that relate to their identity. Because people are not just placeholders for questions. They're not just placeholders for propositions. They're human beings made in the image and likeness of God who have a history, who have suffered, who have struggled, who have yearnings, who have pains, fears, doubts. They're made in the image and likeness of God. And so when anyone asks a question or makes a comment related to Christianity, you should have big ears. And I'll tell you what, this is a very appropriate answer. I'm not sure. I'll have to think about it. Or, it's very appropriate sometimes just to pause for a while and let some good thoughts settle in your mind before you open your big fat mouth. Now, sometimes it's hard to do that because people are not used to silence. I find that all the time. The way I speak is I sometimes pause to find the proper word because I like to try to find a word that fits perfectly in the sentences that I form. I often fail, but that's my goal. It has been ever since high school. I don't know why. It's just a weird thing about me. So, when I'm sometimes searching for a word, when I'm talking with someone, they fill it in for me. Don't do that, please. Um, now, you know, when we're interacting with other people, we should listen to them. We shouldn't complete their sentences. And we might say, let me think about that for a minute. Or I'm not sure. Or this might be right. What do you think? You know, when you do your apologetic interviews, I am sure, I make a prediction now, okay, that many of the people you will interact with will say this about your interview. I have never dealt with a Christian before who listened to me. If this year is like any other year, because it always happens. Or I have never dealt with a Christian before who listened to my perspective and was willing to interact with it without just jumping on me or dumping the gospel on me or pushing me to make some kind of a decision. See, sometimes we rush into it and we alienate people. Or we don't do anything. We don't do apologetics or evangelism. We're just timid, cowards, basically. So, you, you have a kind of internal repertoire. Uh, use another jazz term. You have your chops. But the way you play your chops de depends on the environment. It depends on the people you're working with, see? So, you know, when Sonny Rollins teamed up with Coleman Hawkins to uh, make an album, Coleman Hawkins was a big influence on Sonny Rollins, Sonny played very differently than he usually played in a quartet without another saxophonist. Because he was responding to his environment. He was using his chops, you can tell it's Sonny Rollins. But he's playing with his hero and his mentor, and so he changed his style a little bit 
not to sound like him. He's also an extremely intelligent person to be able to do something like that. So you, you master the chops, and a lot of that is time in the woodshed, and a lot of it is just interacting with unbelievers, trial and error, and then you try to respect the person as an authentic human being with real questions. Schaefer used to say that any honest question deserves an honest answer. And the honest answer may be, I'm not sure. Or I don't know. Or I've thought about that too. And I don't know. Or it may be, I think this for these seven reasons. You know, you might really be able to jam on that thing. Like, well, how do you know Jesus rose from the dead? I'm glad you asked that question. Do you have three hours? You know? Um, does that help? I hope. Okay. I'm sorry. Time's up. Next. No. Go ahead. But where then is, is there a place, and so where is the place for the line, the fine line between open mindedness and doubting your own apologetics? Mm-hmm. Well, it really depends on how well developed your faith is. You want to have as much certainty as possible. There's nothing wrong with certainty if it's warranted. I mean, I would like to hold my beliefs with certainty, the ones that are most important to me. But I don't want to create a false certainty that's based on ignorance. I think we have to be honest with ourselves. Now, this, this is the posture that I think we should try to take with unbelievers. And it's basically living dangerously. If you want to do apologetics, you are living dangerously. You are, in a sense, working without a net. The net is the Holy Spirit. But you don't have a humanly set up kind of Situation. I mean, if you're giving a talk, as I do sometimes, and I'm hoping to do more this year, a talk at a campus, like Are All Religions One or Is Everything Relative or something, and you open up for questions, you're now playing without a net. Because they can ask you anything, and you have to come up with a good response. Now, I'm not playing without a net because the Holy Spirit is there in that sense, and I spend a lot of time on my chops. But it could be that somebody asks me a question I'm not sure how to respond to. And instead of faking it, I have to say, I'm not sure. Talk to me afterwards. I do know of a few books you could read to talk about it. But it's not that you're saying this. You know, a lot of people think that for you to believe that Christianity is objectively and absolutely and universally true, that you have to hold that belief in a very blinkered, protective dogmatic, reactionary mode, like an ayatollah. That is, I believe this is true, and don't you dare challenge it. And if you challenge it, you are an infidel, and you're going to hell. Now, it's possible to hold your beliefs with certainty and engage in dialogue. In fact, I think the more certain you are of your beliefs, the more you've thought them through, reasoned them through, interacted with people about them, the more freedom you have to interact with other people's questions. Because you're not so worried that someone is going to throw something at you that you have no idea how to deal with. So what I try to do when I get in these settings and I say, okay, here's my apologetic for Christianity. I think it's true. I think it's rational. What do you think about it? Any question is legitimate. And I'll try to be as honest as I can in answering the questions. Many people have never seen this happen. Because they run into Christians that just run away from apologetics and any kind of interaction. Or they run into Christians that are absolutely certain and have absolutely no reason why. But if you say, no, I'm certain, I believe this is true, and here's why. And if you think I'm wrong, tell me why I'm wrong and I'll try to respond to your objection the best I can. That is a model that is rare in our culture. Extremely rare. But I think it's very powerful when it works. There's another comment here. Yes. Pilates, Christianity. Yeah. But if it's just kind of like a 
self self help. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Hey, I'm doing this cool thing. You can get into it. You know, use. Uh, it, it can almost be, and, and I know that that's a dangerous path to go down, but it seems like these are. I mean, I see why people do it because it, it, it is accepted. If there's anything accepted in Pokemon culture, it's that. It's that I'm a Christian, but not the kind you're thinking about. I'm talking about the cool Mexican art paintings of Jesus in South America. And, and you know what I mean? It's kind of like uh, it's my little niche thing. Well, that's the problem. You see, that's the problem because if you present it as another niche, then it's not the way of the truth and the life. Now, as I said, you want to commend the faith by all means possible, all means proper, all means proper, I should say. So that involves something like, I believe God is a God of beauty. He created the world beautiful and He's given us the ability to be artistic. And so I prize certain works of art. In fact, these works of art communicate certain things about the Christian worldview. Terrific. But you see, if you make Christianity just another lifestyle or another spiritual journey, then it loses all its saliency. It loses its sting. It loses its blood. It loses its cross. And that's what I'm afraid has happened to much of modern or contemporary Christianity. There's no cross. There's no blood. There's no repentance. Now, people come to faith in a lot of ways and maybe they might come to a, a place and think, well, these people are cool. You know, they're not as judgmental as these other Christians and they're more interested in art and I can relate more to the music. Good. But you've got to get people to that cross or they're not going to come to Christ. See. Does that does that scratch where you're itching a little bit? Yes. Well, even there, they have a rational argument. They say it can't be true if my, my beloved relative or friend goes to hell. So they're operating on some kind of rational argument there. So you'd have to talk about the justice and holiness of God and the provision of Christ and the hope that the person might convert, but that there is one way. Uh, remember, the cross is offensive to people. It's the end of pride. It's the end of self-sufficiency. It's the end of, of humanly constructed religion. So we'll always be offensive. We can't change that. And if you change that, it's no longer Christianity. You're apostate. But now there are emotional blocks that people have that may not have to do with arguments. I mean, a lot of people want to keep their distance from Christianity not because they've found some doctrine to be intellectually repellent, because they've run into a bad pastor. Or their parents were extremely hypocritical Christians. They don't want anything to do with it. So maybe you have to interact with that part of it, that emotional wounding, before they can even listen to the message or listen to the argument. So, again, you have to be very, very flexible and very sensitive in terms of what to say when and try to figure out what the main problem is. Because, you know, we want to move people from here to the cross. And what are the obstacles to getting to the cross? There are all kinds of obstacles. So we have to try to figure out what they are. And that requires questions, discernment. And then we try to, as best we can, soften those obstacles so people can push through them. Okay. Yeah, let me just take a few more questions and we'll take about a 10 minute break. I'm going so slowly through my outline, but that's a problem I always have. So, Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Yeah, it might be that someone is really ripe for the gospel and when they hear it, they believe it. Because God has so acted on their hearts that they just believe and they know it's true and they commit to Christ. No doubts, or very few doubts, very few questions. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. But if that person is even semi-conscious in a postmodern pluralistic world, they're going to bump into all kinds of non-Christian perspectives and philosophies. And if they think about anything, they're going to have to ask some hard questions about the meaning and significance of their faith. So the, the apologetics may not be necessary on the front end with some people. You declare it's true and you call people to Christ and His cross and people respond. But then as part of discipleship, you need to have a reason for the hope that is within you. Everyone, that's a command for every Christian. It's not just for professors or pastors or evangelists or something. It's for everybody. So part of discipleship Ship is having a reason for the hope that you have and being able to give it to others with gentleness and respect. But, you know, if someone is really wide open to Christ, they understand it, they want to come to Christ, then you, you try to be a good shepherd and show them what they need to do. And you don't want to create any doubts in their mind or anything like that. Yeah, maybe one or two more before we take a break. Uh, yes. Hmm. Um, I come across a lot of very well-trained intellectual non-believers. So mm-hmm. not only am I here to strengthen my own faith, but to help me evangelize me at an intellectual level, because that's where I always get stopped. Mm-hmm. Because I, I came to Christ five years ago, so I have ten, if not close to a hundred friends from high school and mm-hmm. before that that are caught up on intellectual issues. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I, you know, I have a small group in my church, and I told them about this healing of mind conference. Yeah, that's right up your alley, you know. That sounds like your kind of thing. Um, your hobby. Yeah, it, it almost makes me feel like they're saying, you know, your faith isn't really strong like mine. You need to prove it to yourself. You need to win arguments. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then I wonder in my mind, is that why I'm doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, because I do find myself doing that. I'll, I'll engage in debates, which I do all the time uh, with people, and I get frustrated that I get, you know, I fall off the cliff. Yeah, you don't want to lose. You want to, you want to win the argument. Why am I seeing this in my church community? I mean, nobody thinks it's cool that I'm in this class. I'm going to talk to you. It makes me feel like, you know, you're struggling with your own faith and how they make you feel. Although they don't say that. Sure. But the subtext is there. Right. Yeah, we'll come back to that when I talk about the relationship of faith and reason. But part of it is a defensive coping mechanism. That is, we don't really have to outthink the world for Christ. We believe, we have faith, God gave us the faith, and we declare it and we hope that God, that other people come to faith. But defending it is not part of the, the ballgame. And in fact, the people that need to have it defended are actually weaker because they need reasons and arguments, whereas we just believe, you know, we, as I once heard Amy Grant say, my great intellectual hero, I just, I just know that I know in my knower. What can you say? You know, baby, baby. I guess that's all you can say after that. All right. Uh, let's come back at uh, 812, 812. And I have to take a vow of silence for 12 minutes. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to go to my office and vaporize and get my voice cranked up. I'll come back in 12 minutes. Okay, folks, let's recongregate, please. I threw out this word in the first half of the class. Did anybody catch it? Noetic. Who knows what noetic means? I talked about the noetic effects of sin. Yeah, the effect of the fall on the human mind. Noetic essentially means cognitive. Okay, the noetic effects of the fall or the cognitive effects of the fall. Okay, good. Okay, we were at point five, two types of apologetics. 
Uh, there are negative apologetics and two different types of negative apologetics. The first is to find intellectual weaknesses in non-Christian worldviews, whether it's naturalism, pantheism, deism, polytheism, random eclecticism, the worldview of many postmodern Americans. But this is basically building on Jesus' idea that unless you build your house on the truth, you're building on sand. That's how he concluded the Sermon on the Mount. If you build your house on what I've taught you, you will withstand the storm. If not, you will fall. So a very significant part of apologetics is critical and negative. And it's all right to be critical and negative intellectually if you're polite and if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Because in order to get at the truth, you have to oppose error. It's very basic. So let's say you're talking to someone about Jesus and they say, oh, I love Jesus. Jesus is my favorite guru this week. All right, you've got some work to do. That sentiment towards Jesus is not aimed at the truth of Jesus. It's aimed at a false conception of Jesus as a guru, swami, yogi, master, avatar, something of that nature. You're dealing with a pantheist, someone who thinks everything is divine. Jesus is divine. He happened to realize his divinity better than most people. So he becomes a model for us. That's not biblical Christology, if you didn't notice. Now, in order to present the real Jesus to someone who has this bogus Christology, you're going to have to undermine their Christology. So, negative apologetics tries to show the intellectual flaws, weaknesses, foibles of non-Christian worldviews. Now, this is extremely important. Why? If someone is completely at home, completely happy with their worldview, they won't care anything about Christianity, will they? Oh, Christians, they believe these various things. That's fine for them, or they have the freedom to believe that, or if it works for them. But I'm perfectly comfortable, perfectly happy with my uh, Buddhist meditation and going to uh, the Unitarian Church once every few months to uh, listen to some edifying thoughts. So, in a sense, you have to go on the offensive. Now, you have to do that carefully and with discernment. Because in our day, oftentimes, if you criticize someone's perspective, it's interpreted as hating them. Now, talk about a recipe for anti-intellectualism. If I criticize what you believe, I somehow hate you. And we shouldn't hate people. That's the one absolute. We should be tolerant. That's the absolute, right? Right? So, it just dismisses, it destroys any kind of intellectual discourse. But if you develop a relationship of trust with people, a relationship of dialogue, then you can explore ideas, test ideas, to see whether they make sense, to see if they're true. Now, negative apologetics means another thing. It also tends to mean, in some settings, how we respond to attacks on the Christian worldview. So let's say someone says, oh God, that's just a figment of your imagination. People create God in order to feel more secure in a hostile universe. Well, we'll come back to that. That's called the projection theory of religion. It was was advanced by Feuerbach, Freud, a different version, and Marx, and so on. Now, you need to rebut that kind of a challenge. That's another understanding of what negative apologetics is. Or if someone says, Christianity is a hopelessly and incorrigibly male-centered, male-dominated religion where God is male and male is divine. All right, now that's a misunderstanding of Christianity. You have to do some work to undo that misunderstanding. That's also considered negative apologetics. Positive apologetics has to do with giving constructive reasons and evidence for the defining Christian truth claims. So we're dealing with arguments for objective truth and morality, the importance of rationality, the existence of God, the reliability of the Bible, supremacy of Jesus. And we'll talk about this more in following weeks. But the goal is to give what's called a cumulative case argument for the Christian worldview, meaning that we draw on a variety of lines of evidence that all converge on the truth of the Christian worldview. So we have evidence from science, from cosmology, from 
religious experience, from history, and so on. And we believe that the evidence points towards, strongly points towards, the Christian worldview. Now, whether something is considered positive or negative apologetics may depend on the angle you look at it, which angle you look at it from. But the basic point is to bring people to Christ, to bring people to the cross, and to deal with any obstacles they may have. Now, if they're perfectly happy with their worldview, that's an obstacle. You need to try to show there's something wrong with their perspective. It either is internally inconsistent, that is, the worldview has propositions that disagree with each other, or that it makes some kind of a factual claim that is false, like Muslims claim Jesus was not crucified. That's an interpretation of the Quran. That's false. That would have to be challenged. Or another dimension would be that the worldview is actually unlivable. So many New Agers believe there's no such thing as evil. Evil is merely a state of mind that you need to transcend. Now, what if they condemn the atrocities of 9-11 in objective, powerful terms? Well, they're, they're being inconsistent with their worldview because if they were at a higher level of consciousness, it wouldn't bother them because all is one ohm and go on with life. So, the way you understand it, is it, am I doing positive or negative apologetics? You don't have to worry about that so much. But if someone is locked into a worldview that keeps them from even understanding the Christian faith or coming to terms with it, seeing its rationality, you want to try to jostle that worldview. You also, of course, want to try to find common ground with that person. And we'll go on and talk about that in much more detail. A full orb Christian apologetic will combine positive and negative apologetics, depending on the situation. All right, let me talk about reasons and justifications for Christian apologetics. I hope I brought my Bible with me, and I guess I somehow did not. So I might ask a few of you to read some passages. Oh, here they are. Here's some down here. It's good to have a few Bibles around a seminary once in a while. All right, some reasons and justifications for this, this thing we're talking about, apologetics. We should be doing this only if we can do so. Sorry about that. Try to reattach this thing. Only if we can do it for the glory of God. Apologetics should only be done if the enterprise is submitted to the lordship of God and glorifies God. That's the purpose of existence, is to glorify God. Because God is the supreme object of value. The end the goal, the thoroughly good and holy creator. So apologetics should be done for the glory of God, whether or not they're successful. Now, you want to be successful. Frankly, I like to win arguments. I don't like losing arguments, but I have to be willing to lose an argument if I'm shown that I'm wrong. That's intellectual humility. But we should attempt to give the best possible arguments and be the best possible people to defend and commend the Christian faith. Now, we do this because we're called to do it, and we do it to reach unbelievers for the cause of Christ. And the classic text is 1 Peter 3. Let's read that quickly if I've got everything here. First Peter 3, 15, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord, That's foundational. This is why we do this. Because he is is Lord. He is worthy of worship and obedience. Always be prepared to give an answer. Now, that's that word we get apologetics from. An answer means to give a case in court. Give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason, that's logos, the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Now, there's a lot in this verse. Set apart Christ as Lord. You don't want to engage in apologetics for your own ego, for your own cause. You're doing it for the cause of Christ. Be prepared, which means have your chops down. Spend the time in the woodshed. When anyone, get this, asks you. How many people are asking you about your Christian faith? Now, people ask me about it if I give a lecture and I open it up for questions. That's sort of my best venue for it. But I do have interpersonal times with unbelievers once in a while where they will ask me questions about my faith. 
and I'd like to have more. But interestingly, the idea is that you're living the kind of life that causes people to ask you, what are you all about? What is it that you believe? Why do you believe this? That's very important to uh, focus on. So give a reason for the hope in the gospel. Now, if your reason is, I just know that I know in my knower, I'm not sure where we go from there. And frankly, I don't view that as some exalted view of faith. And people that like to deal with arguments and reasons are at some kind of a kindergarten level. You see, the evangelicals, many evangelicals have to thoroughly rethink their doctrine of rationality. Now, the reason they don't rethink it is because they never thought about it for the first time. But we have this idea that rationality is worldly and faith is spiritual. And we have false texts to support that, like Colossians 2.8. Don't be taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy that depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Well, did you notice the qualifiers? False and deceptive philosophy? Paul was responding to a false and deceptive philosophy in Colossians by articulating the Christian worldview. He challenged the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts 17, 16-34, by understanding their philosophers, quoting their philosophers, finding common ground, and giving a rational argument why they should not worship idols. This, this dichotomy between faith and reason is biblically bogus. And God calls us to reason together with Him in Isaiah 1.18. We are called in Jude 3 to contend for the once and for all revealed truth of God. Contend means be willing to argue. Put it this way. You should, you should give a rip about this stuff. You know, it's sorry to get too technical here. But you should give a rip. That is, when you see something in the newspaper that misrepresents Christianity horribly, it should tick you off. Look at Acts 17.16 sometimes. It says that before Paul preached his eloquent, marvelous sermon on Mars Hill, before the, some of the greatest intellectuals of his day, it said he was deeply distressed in his spirit because of all the idols. He was angry. He had fire in his bones and it had to come out. We should be willing in the appropriate setting, in the appropriate way, reverencing Christ as Lord with gentleness and respect to take what we believe to the streets. It should matter to us. It should concern us. And in fact, if you really get involved in this area of biblical discipleship and spiritual discipline called apologetics, it will make your life more uncomfortable. And in fact, in some ways, you will suffer more. But you know what? I've never seen it in the Gospel that Jesus called us to a life without suffering or a life of comfort. It's not there. Show it to me. Ultimate fulfillment? Ultimate joy forever with Christ and redeemed creation? Yes. But there's something called a cross that is not optional. And the cross has an application to apologetics. When you mix it up with people, they can get nasty. They can insult you. When you start to see all this error systematically inscribed in our culture and even in the church, it makes you miserable. When you hear teachers and preachers denigrating the intellect and making fun of philosophers and apologists and theologians, it bothers you. When you hear worship songs, songs that are mindless lyrics that have nothing to do with the Bible, it angers you and it ruins your worship time. I am calling you to get more miserable. And it's biblical too. Read James 4 sometime. It's biblical to get miserable over sin and over fallenness in this fallen world. But we're called to do it and in the long run it's rewarding. I'll never forget the time when I realized that I was in, in this dispute for keeps. It was the summer of 1977 and I wrote a letter to the editor about Christianity comparing a Taoist priest who came to campus with a man who was a Hindu had become a Christian. And I went back home that summer, home to Anchorage, Alaska, 
and a friend of mine sent me a copy of the student newspaper. And in it was a letter by one of my professors denouncing me. I'd t- taken a class called uh, Ancient Mediterranean Religion, taught by a very, very liberal scholar. And he berated me in that letter, said, Grotai should know better, he took my class. Christianity is no different than any other ancient Mediterranean religion. He was working from the evolution of religion theory and German higher criticism and the whole nine yards. And when I read that, something just, it was, I hate to use this expression, uh, seared into my soul in a non-John Kerry sort of way. (laughs) It was seared into my soul. You know what, Doug? You're playing for keeps. You write a letter to the editor and your professor comes after you in print. It was sort of like, wake up. Now, I'd been a Christian for about a year or two at that point, And I knew what was going on to some degree, but it was kind of a defining moment for me. And I wrote a letter back to him. I'd been studying some of the things he brought up and I had some answers, I thought. Uh, I sent it to the newspaper and the newspaper had stopped publishing for the summer and then I sent it to him. <clears throat> and I saw him the next school year, not for a class, of course. And I asked him, I said, Professor Sanders, did you receive my letter? He said, yes. And that was the end of that. <laughs> contend, contend for the faith given once for all the saints. Refute false philosophies, many biblical verses on that. I talked about Colossians 2, 8, 9. There's also 2 Corinthians 10, about taking every thought captive to obey Christ and refuting false philosophies. 1 John 4, 1 through 4 warns about Antichrist, the deny the coming of Christ in the flesh. You can't help but see polemics when you read the Bible. I mean, the idea is this is true. This has eternal consequences. Everyone needs to know this. God has called a people, a peculiar people, out of the fallenness, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light, and you have work to do, and it's time to get uncomfortable. And it's time to contend for the faith and it's going to be dirty and it's going to be difficult, but I am with you and it needs to be done. Now, apologetics can also build up believers who doubt. And one of the reasons I firmly believe that much of evangelicalism is so intellectually enfeebled is that people have doubts and they don't know what to do with the doubts. Now, if you deal with a doubt responsibly and you find an answer or at least a partial answer, you grow in your faith. Having a doubt or a question does not mean you're not really a Christian. It does not mean you're somehow substandard as a spiritual being. It means you are a questioning being. You need something solid to chew on. And I don't have time to deal with it. I've got a whole sermon on this, but in Matthew 11, 1 through 11, we find that John the Baptist had doubts about the messianic identity of Jesus. And the way Jesus responded to him was to give him a logical modus ponens argument. He didn't say, oh, John, what's wrong with you? Have more faith. Sing more hymns. Don't worry about it. Just believe. You know, something like this. And when you tell people who are doubting, just believe, it does about as much good as you tell somebody with a broken leg to just walk. They're already trying to believe. You may need to give them something to strengthen them. And that's what Jesus did. Basically, he recited his messianic credentials. And the argument goes, if someone is the Messiah, he will do this. I am doing this, therefore I am the Messiah. It's a modus ponens argument, appealing to empirical evidence and fulfilled prophecy. That's how Jesus dealt with the doubt of John the Baptist. What about the man who came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe. Notice how he probably said, Lord. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus didn't say, get out of here until you have perfect faith. He answered the man's request. Apologetics is crucial for discipleship, for mentoring, in building up people's intellectual firepower. Because if we're calling people in the churches to win your neighborhood for Christ, or have an impact on politics and culture for Christ, or be concerned about missions and sacrifice for missions, or maybe be a missionary full-time, part-time, 
and people are having fundamental questions about the truth and rationality of their faith, is it any wonder they're not doing what they should be doing? You cannot call a person to totally commit themselves to the cause of Christ if their mind is lagging behind. You see? We need conviction. And it's more than revving people up emotionally. It's giving arguments. It's giving reasons. You had a comment? Yeah, we'll come back to Thomas. Corduan has a good comment about Thomas, but you shouldn't take the Thomas example to mean that it was pointless for Jesus to give reasons to think he was resurrected. I mean, in the book of Acts, it says he appeared with many convincing proofs, and it was a good idea to do that. Now, Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and have never seen. But that doesn't mean that they just know that they know when they're knower. You know? I mean, we take these verses and we import all kinds of things that just are not there. I mean, when Jesus said, for instance, you should have faith like a child, some people think you should be a simpleton. You think Jesus is calling people to be a simpleton? He's challenging people, calling people to be sincere, to be earnest, to be trusting. But as I've tried to point out in my book on Jesus, Jesus was a very savvy thinker. I think he's a kind of philosopher, really. He engaged in rational arguments with people. Some very sophisticated ones. Very tricky arguments, especially in Matthew 22 when he has to deal with Christ and Caesar and he has to deal with marriage and the resurrection. Those were very tough intellectual problems to solve. And he didn't say, well, if you don't believe me, you're going to hell. Or, I'll do a miracle to show that I'm right and I don't have to answer your stupid questions. So I think we've misread the Scriptures in so many ways. So anyway, we can build up believers who doubt... And I gave this reference to a Hope for Today webpage. It should be hopefortoday.com, not org, if you're interested in those sermons. I think really apologetics also encourages holiness in knowing and defending God's truth. Matthew 22, 37-40 says, Love the Lord your God with all of your being, including your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We shouldn't separate holiness from intellectual rectitude or intellectual achievement. Basically, we are all called to use all of our intellectual ability to love God, whatever that intellectual ability may be. And people are given differing gifts according to the work of the Spirit. But whatever your ability is, it should be used to glorify God. And it's a part of holiness. It is not holy to be anti-intellectual. Now, are there some holy people that just don't really deal with that area and they're very kind and very godly and they know the scripture and they do good works, yes. And they have a measure of holiness. Terrific. But it is not somehow a defining property of holiness to deny the mind or cast aspersions upon others who are pursuing the life of the mind. We have the great example of Paul in Acts 17, which I alluded to earlier. Just a few comments there. First of all, Paul was stirred up in his spirit about the idols in Athens. This was an unscheduled stop for him when you read the passage. He stirred up. He talks to the Jews and the God-fearers, people that respected the Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures. And with them, he argued from the Bible. Remember, the Bereans checked what he said against the Bible. Now, when he deals with the Greek philosophers, and eventually he's invited into the Areopagus, before a council, he doesn't really directly deal with the Bible because they don't know the Bible and they don't respect the Bible. He deals with their own thinking. He quotes two of their own poets. And then he connects what they have said with a biblical worldview and challenges them not to worship idols. It is, in fact, illogical to worship idols. There's so much more on that. I recently preached two sermons on that, but we're going slowly enough uh, already. Or two, yeah, slowly enough already on this. I don't want to camp out on it. But this is a tremendous example of apologetics in action. Now, some people say, well, Paul was in the flesh when he did this. And when he writes to Corinth, he gives up on all that philosophy and he's just back on the cross. Talk about eisegesis. I mean, talk about reading something in. There's nothing in the account in Acts 17 that shows that Paul failed. 
Now, masses did not convert, but a few people did convert. And he was giving, given a hearing in front, in front of one of the most prestigious philosophical bodies of that day. It was a council that had to do with education and the promulgation of various views in that day. He was dealing with Greek philosophers. And he knew how to do it. He knew some Greek philosophy. Paul was very well educated. But he compared their worldview, which was either atheistic or pantheistic, with the biblical worldview. So we see a great example of apologetics in Paul. Moreover, we see it in Jesus. As I point out in chapters 1 and 3, especially in my book on Jesus. Jesus argued with people. He used various argument forms. He challenged people intellectually. Now, sometimes he simply made pronouncements on the basis of authority. But he was not afraid of dealing with some very challenging arguments. But he was not afraid of dealing with some very challenging arguments. But he was not afraid of dealing with some very challenging arguments. But he was not afraid of dealing with some very challenging arguments. But he was not afraid of dealing with some very challenging arguments.